let's preview the text features found in this article prior to reading. I see the title, How Do I Kill Thee? Let Me Count the Waves. I notice that this article is divided into columns. There are four columns of text. I'll start on the far left hand side, reading from the top to the bottom, moving over to the right, reading from the top to the bottom in each column, and that's how I'll read this article. I also notice that the article has six paragraphs and they are numbered. That will help us when we are reading. This article also contains four photographs. The first photograph is of a python. The second photograph in the second column is a boa constrictor. The third picture in the top above the third and fourth columns is a snake called the fur de lance. I know that because I'm reading the caption, the little words that are right underneath the picture, and that tells me the name of this snake is a fur de lance. The last picture is found in the third column at the bottom, and this picture, if I read the caption right next to it, this picture is showing a copperhead and the caption says a copperhead uses its fangs and its jaws to walk its prey, a mouse, toward its throat. Now it's time to preview some of the text features I see in the text. Some of the text features that I see are italics, bold print, quotation marks, and words in parentheses. Starting with paragraph one, I see the word constriction is in italics, and the words pythons and boas are in bold print. I think the author has used these text features to help draw attention to those words. First of all, the word constriction is in italics because the author immediately after that word gives us the definition of what constriction means. And then the words pythons and boas are in bold print because they are names of snakes that we will need to pay attention to. In paragraph two, I see the word regular inside quotation marks. The author has included quotation marks in this paragraph around this word because when they say regular, they don't mean that the teeth are actually regular, it's just regular for the snakes. So when you see the, word, the quotation marks around a word like this, it means it doesn't quite mean what it says. In other words, it has a slightly different meaning, so they use the quotation marks around it to indicate that. In paragraph four, we see another example where the author has included quotation marks around a word. I see the sentence, it says, the two sides of the jaws work independently, walking the prey to the rear of the snake's mouth and down its throat. The author has put quotation marks around the word walking because the snake isn't actually walking the prey, but they are moving the prey into its mouth and down its throat. And so the word walking doesn't really mean walking, but it's a way to show movement, which is why the author has included the quotation marks. In paragraph five, we see examples of bold print, italics, and parentheses. Find the sentence that starts, in one study, a venomous snake called Fur de Lance, Bothrop's Asper, found in Central and South American rainforests, clearings and fields, had its venom removed. The name of the snake, Fur de Lance, is in bold print, and immediately after it I see a word inside parentheses, and that word is also in italics, because this is the scientific name of the Fur de Lance. The author is indicating that it is the scientific name by putting it in quotation marks and in italics. Finally, in paragraph 
6, we see three more examples of italics. And again, the italics are used to draw your attention to the word. And in the case of beta blockers and anticoagulants, the author has put those in italics because they might be words that are unknown to you. And you'll want to look around that word for context clues to figure out the definition of those words. So it's important to pay attention to words in italics. Now we're going to preview some important vocabulary words before we start reading the entire article. Paragraph 1, Sentence 2. Some snakes use constriction. They seize the prey with their small, backward-pointing teeth, then quickly wrap themselves around the victim and tighten their muscles to suffocate it. The first word that we're going to highlight is the word seize. Seize means to grab. The second word we're going to highlight is the word suffocate. Suffocate means to kill something by stopping its breathing. Now I'm going to reread that sentence, replacing those two words with alternative words so you can hear what they mean. Some snakes use constriction. They grab the prey with their small, backward-pointing teeth then quickly wrap themselves around the victim and tighten their muscles to kill it by stopping its breath. Paragraph 4, Sentences 1 and 2. Snake venom has to work quickly and efficiently to subdue prey. That's why it's so potent. Our vocabulary word here is potent. Potent means strong. Let's replace the word potent with the word strong and reread the sentences to see if it makes sense. Snake venom has to work quickly and efficiently to subdue prey. That's why it is so strong. Paragraph 6, Sentence 2. In fact, snake venom components are used in many areas of medicine. The word components in this sentence means parts. Let's replace the word components with parts as we reread that sentence. In fact, snake venom parts are used in many areas of medicine. How do I kill thee? Let me count the ways. Paragraph 1. Not all snakes use venom to kill their victims. Some snakes use constriction. They seize the prey with their small, backward-pointing teeth, then quickly wrap themselves around the victim and tighten their muscles to suffocate it. The most famous of these constrictors are the pythons and boas. Paragraph 2. Like the constrictors, venomous snakes have regular teeth, to seize prey and to prevent it from slipping out of their mouths, but they also have a pair of hollow fangs in their upper jaws to inject toxins. If a snake loses a fang, another one usually replaces it, sometimes as often as once a week. Baby venomous snakes are born with fangs and the ability to inject venom. They will shed teeth and fangs many times during their lives. Paragraph 3 some snakes bite and hold their prey, chewing to inject venom deep in the wound. Others strike and quickly withdraw. As for a snake's forked tongue, it cannot sting. It is used to taste or smell the air to find food. Paragraph 4. Snake venom has to work quickly and efficiently to subdue prey. That's why it's so potent. A struggling victim is dangerous, not only when it is caught, but also when it is swallowed. It could easily break the snake's ribs or skull. So the snake waits until the prey is paralyzed, tracks it by smell, and then swallows it. A snake's jaws are connected by stretchy skin and ligaments, 
so it can open its mouth very wide. The two sides of the jaws work independently, walking the prey to the rear of the snake's mouth and down its throat. Paragraph 5. A snake's venom is actually modified saliva. It is produced in special glands below and behind the snake's eyes, and it flows into tissues surrounding the base of the fangs and then into the fangs' venom canals. It is mostly made up of proteins in the form of enzymes that help break down the prey quickly. In one study, a venomous snake called Fertilance, Bothrops asper, found in Central and South American rainforests, clearings, and fields, had its venom removed. Instead of the two or three days the snake usually needed to digest a rat, it took this snake 12 days. Paragraph 6. Studies of Bothrop's venom have also resulted in the discovery of beta blockers, drugs used to treat cardiovascular diseases. In fact, snake venom components are used in many areas of medicine. From cobra venom, scientists have developed several painkillers. Other venoms have produced anticoagulants that prevent blood clots. Venoms are currently being investigated for their potential to kill harmful viruses and bacteria and to treat other cardiovascular, nerve, muscular, and joint diseases as well as visual disorders. Alright, now that you've read through the article, we are going to be writing a summary. You can ask yourself, what is a summary? A summary of nonfiction text tells the main points of the text and includes the main idea and supporting details. When writing a summary, you must ask yourself, first, what is the big idea explained in the text? In other words, what is the main idea? You can find the main idea by asking yourself who or what is the text about? And then what do you learn about him, her, or it? So when you're writing a summary, you first need to find the main idea by asking yourself, what is the big idea explained in the text? Then you can ask yourself, what facts or examples in this text help me understand that big idea? In other words, what are the supporting details that help me come up with that main idea or big idea? Your summary should have three parts. Part one is the topic sentence or the main idea. Part two are the details. You must include at least three supporting details from the article. And part three, you need to have a conclusion sentence restating the main idea. Now let's go back to the article we just read and try summarizing. Okay, after reviewing what I need to have in a summary, I'm looking back at the article and I'm thinking to myself, what is the big idea explained in this text? Who or what is this text about? So when I think back to all the information that I read, I'm thinking that I read about snakes, but more specifically, I learned ways that snakes kill their victims. And the two ways that I learned that snakes kill their victims are through constriction and venom. And so answering the question, who or what did I learn about? I would have to answer that I learned about constriction and venom. And what did I learn about those things? I learned that those are ways that snakes use to kill their prey. Based on this, I think the big idea explained in the text is that constriction and venom are two different ways some snakes use to kill their prey. If you said the same thing, then you were correct. Now that I found the big idea, I need to find some supporting details. So I ask myself, what facts or examples in this text help me understand the big idea? To do this, I'm going to look back at the text, I'm going to reread, and I'm going to find three details to support my main idea. Reminder that the main idea is that constriction and venom are two different ways some snakes use to kill their prey. 
In other words, I'm going to find three examples of how snakes use either constriction and or venom to kill their prey. Now we're going to reread the article. I'm putting up here the main idea to help remind you. Constriction and venom are two different ways some snakes use to kill their prey. Remember that your task is to find at least three examples of how snakes either use constriction and or venom to kill their prey. How do I kill thee? Let me count the ways. Paragraph 1. Not all snakes use venom to kill their victims. Some snakes use constriction. They seize the prey with their small, backward-pointing teeth, then quickly wrap themselves around the victim and tighten their muscles to suffocate it. The most famous of these constrictors are the pythons and boas. Now that we've reread paragraph one, I see that pythons and boas use constriction to squeeze their prey to death. That's one example of how constriction is used by snakes to kill their prey. Paragraph two. Like the constrictors, venomous snakes have regular teeth to seize prey and to prevent it from slipping out of their mouths. But they also have a pair of hollow fangs in their upper jaws to inject toxins. If a snake loses a fang, another one usually replaces it sometimes as often as once a week. Baby venomous snakes are born with fangs and the ability to inject venom. They will shed teeth and fangs many times during their lives. After rereading paragraph two, I saw that venomous snakes actually invet inject venom into their prey through holes in their hollow fangs. That is an example of how snakes use venom to kill their prey. Paragraph 3. Some snakes bite and hold their prey, chewing to inject venom deep in the wound. Others strike and quickly withdraw. As for a snake's forked tongue, it cannot sting. It is used to taste or smell the air to find food. Paragraph 4. Snake venom has to work quickly and efficiently to subdue prey. That's why it's so potent. A struggling victim is dangerous, not only when it is caught, but also when it is swallowed. It could easily break the snake's ribs or skull. So the snake waits until the prey is paralyzed, tracks it by smell, and then swallows it. A snake's jaws are connected by stretchy skin and ligaments, so it can open its mouth very wide. The two sides of the jaws work independently, walking the prey to the rear of the snake's mouth and down its throat. After rereading paragraphs 3 and 4, I saw that venom can actually paralyze their prey, making it easier for the snake to swallow it. This is another example of how snakes use venom to kill their prey. Paragraph 5. A snake's venom is actually modified saliva. It is produced in special glands below and behind the snake's eyes and it flows into tissues surrounding the base of the fangs and then into the fangs venom canals. It is mostly made up of proteins in the form of enzymes that help break down the prey quickly. In one study, a venomous snake called Fertilance, Bothrops asper, found in Central and South American rainforests, clearings and fields, had its venom removed. Instead of the two or three days the snake usually needed to digest a rat, it took this snake 12 days. After rereading paragraph 5, I read that venom also helps snakes digest their prey quickly. When they took the venom out of the fertilance, that snake was not able to digest its prey as quickly, so that helps me figure out that venom is another way that snakes use to digest their prey quickly. That's how it helps them. Paragraph 6. Studies of Bothrop's venom have also resulted in the discovery of beta blockers, drugs used to treat cardiovascular diseases. In fact, 
snake venom components are used in many areas of medicine. From cobra venom, scientists have developed several painkillers. Other venoms have produced anticoagulants that prevent blood clots. Venoms are currently being investigated for their potential to kill harmful viruses and bacteria and to treat other cardiovascular, nerve, muscular, and joint diseases as well as visual disorders. After rereading the last paragraph, paragraph 6, I notice that it's mostly about how scientists are using snake venom to help humans with different with different things and so that doesn't really fit our main idea of the ways that snakes use constriction and venom to kill their prey so I'm not going to include any details from paragraph 6 in my summary. Now let's put all this information together to make a summary paragraph. Now it's time to write your summary. Remember that a summary of nonfiction text tells the main points of the text, it includes the main idea and the supporting details. Your summary should have three parts. Number one, you need the topic sentence or main idea. Two are the details, which includes at least three supporting details. And three, you need to write a conclusion sentence, which restates your topic. Let's review the information that we have gathered from our article in order to write our summary. Number one, topic sentence or main idea. Constriction and venom are two different ways some snakes use to kill their prey. Number two, details, at least three supporting details. Pythons and boas use constriction to squeeze their prey to death. Venomous snakes inject venom into their prey through holes in their hollow fangs. Venom can paralyze the prey, making it easier for the snake to swallow it. Venom also helps snake digest their prey quickly. And finally, number three, the conclusion sentence. Both venom and constriction are efficient ways for some snakes to get their meals. Notice with the conclusion sentence, I've restated the topic sentence just in a slightly different way to end my paragraph. Now you have all the information you need to put it together into a paragraph and write your summary. Remember, when you're writing your topic sentence, you want to include the title of the article so that your reader knows where you got your information and what article it is that you are summarizing. Very important. On the right hand side of this page you'll see that I've started your paragraph for you with your opening sentence. Notice that it's indented. You can copy this down onto your paper as your beginning sentence. The text, How Do I Kill Thee? Let Me Count the Ways describes how constriction and venom are two different ways some snakes use to kill their prey. Don't forget when you are writing the details, you need to use transitional words and or phrases in between details. You can use the phrases for example, one example is, another example of this is, or finally. Adding these into your paragraph helps make your, your paragraph sound smoother and it makes it easier for the reader to recognize when you're moving from one detail to the next. Good luck!